record on this computer and we're underway. Very good. Um, so Kunevin, one of the things that I found about Kunevin is that it's helpful at any level. Um, and having now paid attention to it for about the last five years and invested considerable sums and time in understanding it much more deeply and attending Cognitive Edge retreats and seminars, um, this is something that I feel is one of the most important things uh, and most contributory, contributory things that one can possibly get to understand and apply to specifically work. But honestly, there's almost no area in life where it doesn't kick in and provide value. Um, let me just get my deck going in the background and then I will think about sharing it out with you guys. Where's my tools? There we go. There we are. You should be able to see a, a dark screen that says Kenevin 201. Does anybody not see that? No, oh, good. Very good. Okay. So oh, there we go. There's David. Welcome, David. That's two Davids tonight. Very good. Well, let me get into it. So um, last week I completed uh, the third week of an advanced Kenevin class, Kenevin and strategy. This had originally been promised back in March in Seattle, but if you know, you had to have been pretty much living under a rock to not know what was going on in Seattle in March, and nobody was going to fly there to attend any kind of public event. So it got deferred and it ended up going online. And um, oh boy. Uh, once again, huge cognitive load going through this stuff. So I've spent most of the last week trying to boil it down into something that would be useful to share with you guys. But do please bear in mind that this is going to be an hour. As usual, we run to a you know a roundabout eight, and then we t you know we'll go over questions and things. So please. Um, I would recommend that you actually write down your questions or put them in chat and then we'll deal with them all at the end. And I'll call a, a soft stop at half past eight. Um, and at that point, anybody who was committed to just attending the session can jump off. But if anybody wants to stick around for you know, another half an hour or so for an after hours chatter, by all means. So anyway, back to, to Kenevin. Um, to give you a little bit of, of um, context, I'm going to take you through some of the history of Kenevin, but I want to frame it first. This was one of the most significant things that came up in this last class. There's nothing like starting a presentation with a bit of Derrida paraphrasing Kierkegaard. The only decision possible is the impossible decision. What? Well, what that's pointing to is that if you already know what to do, then there's no decision. If you can figure something out, there is no decision. So anytime you're actually faced with a decision, it nearly always means that you actually don't know how to make that decision. Hmm. And this is a very good way to frame uh, any kind of introduction to Kenevin. I've got another quote that I just want to throw up the front here. I'm not sure where this came from, but it's uh, an expression I've used many times. Leadership is causing a future that would not have happened on its own. Management is organizing what should have happened on its own. Hmm. So you'll see why I've put those three things up front as we go through. Now, one of the things about any kind of framework, and Kenevin is a framework, is that ideally, uh, if you know what you're on about, you should be able to sketch it out on the back of a napkin with a Sharpie. The trick, of course, is knowing what to sketch out for the person that you're sketching it out for, or the organization, or whoever the audience is, in such a way that it's actually a contribution to them. So while at almost any level, Kenevin is incredibly helpful, it is turtles all the way down. And I abjure you. Um, after an hour of this, you will know stuff that will be applicable in your work, but I hate to say it, it won't make you an expert in Kenevin. 
Uh, I'm not sure if even Dave Snowden, the guy who's been studying it for 30 years and applying it for 30 years, would call himself an expert in Kinevin. Um, there's a great deal to it. It is on, on its surface simple, but boy, it is not obvious. So let's back up a little bit. Where did it get started? Well, the guy that, that got into it all was a fellow called Dave Snowden. Um, he created a, a software development company called Data Science back in the day. They did very well. They were bought by IBM. And he ended up um, being one of the big wheels in their knowledge management area. And this was where he first started to um, develop what became known as the Kinevin sense making framework. So very early on, this was incredibly simple. You may only need to sort of think of it at its simplest as being three domains. The ordered domain, where um, you basically know what you're doing. Um, there is pretty much a direct correlation between cause and effect. And then there's the complex domain, where you can't tell ahead of time how things are going to go. And then chaos, which is where, well, frankly, everything is in chaos. And this got refined into actually four different areas. It was refined in a paper public, originally published internally in IBM called The New Dynamics of Strategy, Sense Making in a Complex and Complicated World. And this was where um, this uh, ordered side was divided into the known and the knowable. Complex was given a few more details, and so was chaos. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on all of these details because they'll get covered as we go through the refinements of it. All right, so that was 2002. Fast forward five years and um, Harvard Business Review, HBR, published a leader's framework for decision making by Dave Snowden and his co-author Mary Boone. This was kind of a big deal. This was where the business world first really heard about Kinevin and it had one heck of an impact. By this time, it had been refined, and there was this graphic produced, which was a little bit more sophisticated. This had shifted the idea of um, known and knowable to being simple and complicated. And it had introduced disorder into the middle. So you could think of, you know, ordered, and then complex and chaotic are unordered, which is a bit like undead, it's a different kind of order. The disorder was like the absence of an awareness of where you were. So that was like the sort of the, the first real iteration. Um, I don't expect you to read all of these details. This was uh, a, a little chart that was uh, within the article. But what I do want you to notice is that the four domains, the four major domains, chaotic, complex, complicated, simple, were given four things to pay attention to. The context characteristics, so how you could identify it. The leader's job, in other words, what you do when you identify that you're in this domain. Danger signals, things that could, could backfire on you, and response to the danger signals. And if you want to know more, it's, a f it's still a fantastically interesting article. Um, and um, I strongly recommend you look it up or ping me for the reference. Now, fast forward another couple of years, um, Dave Snowden was principally developing Kinevin on his blog. He now was running a company called Cognitive Edge, and it was him and a bunch of his colleagues working as consultants to government, NGOs, businesses, all kinds of things. And at this time, this is, this is roughly what the Kinevin framework looked like. And again, we had a little bit of a, a development. Simple had now become obvious. And there was an initial discussion of constraints as really being the way to distinguish the different domains. Things in the obvious domain had rigid constraints. Now, by constraints, we mean things that contain or connect things. The complicated domain had governing constraints. Huh, this was like rules, where in the obvious realm, it was more like laws. This is just how it is, right? But in complicated, yeah, you've got some rules, and if you follow the rules, you open up your choices. Complex had enabling constraints. 
Huh. And I'll explain more about that as we go through, but chaotic is about the absence of constraints. And at this time, there was also a little bit of discussion um, about, um, you see this image down on the bottom right, these little tetrahedrons. This was, this was a discussion maybe about constraints and it's something that got dropped, but it's kind of a cute little image. The idea was that in the, the obvious domain, things were organized very formally and the little yellow center really controlled the network elements. Uh, that was that they were the strong connections. Complicated was full of expertise and all the connections from the center to the network were all very strong. Whereas over in complex, things were much more informal and a center had no real strong connections to the network. And in crisis, well, there were no connections between anything. Now, what's a little unclear, even when you go back to the particular paper that this was discussed in, was what do they mean by the center and what do they mean by the network? So this actually became something that was abandoned over time. But there was, so, there was one very interesting uh, analogy that came up at this time. Thinking about endo and exoskeletons as a way of providing an analogy or a metaphor for constraints. An exoskeleton, like a, a, an insect has, binds that insect. It has to be that shape and size. It's strong and robust, but very rigid. Where uh, an uh, en oh, which one did I say? Exoskeleton. Exoskeleton is for uh, insects. Endoskeletons, which are internal, um, provide a structure on which many different ways of actually having the the exterior of it expressed, right? So this was starting to be development of this whole idea of constraints. If you were to look things up on the Canavian website, this is their current formal version of that version of the Canavian sense-making framework. But over the last year or so, it became considerably deeper and considerably more subtle. Well, I'll tell you what, before I go on to that, let me just go through a few of these, these other aspects. So we've had a quick look at constraints. In the realm of the obvious, this is where you can actually say you have best practices. Hmm. There's typically one obvious thing that, that you would do. Everybody agrees on it. Any sane person knows this is a thing that you do. Best practice. Up in complicated though, there are good practices and there may even be a little disagreement among the experts as to which one would apply, but there may be more than one and actually expertise should figure it out. Over in complex, your practices are emergent and I'll, again, I'll dig into this a lot more as we move ahead. Chaotic practices tend to be novel. And as I always say, you know, if I found myself in the chaotic situation of discovering that my house was on fire, I'd probably adopt the novel practice of jumping out of the window, not my usual approach. And then the, the way to react uh, down and obvious, you just need to sense what's going on. You can categorize what it is and then you know how to respond. You've probably, some of you have seen me do the exercise where I show somebody a pen and say, what's this? And they tell me it's a pen. I say, what do you do with it? And they say, you write with it. And I say, well, how do you know that? Well, it looks like a pen. So actually that covers all of those things. They just look at it, there's the sensing. They know it's a pen, they've already categorized it. And if I ask them what you do with it, they know how to respond to a pen, they draw with it. Whereas up in complicated, you still use your senses, but it requires analysis to select a response. Over in complex, you first of all have to probe into what you're dealing with. You have to experiment with it before you can actually really sense what's going on and then come up with a response. Whereas down in chaotic, you want to act to regain control before you can sense and respond. All right, that gives you a bit of a, a background. Now let's move to the next one. Uh, Dave Snowden, who is very Welsh and very proud of being Welsh, uh, if you want to ingratiate yourself with him, ask him about rugby. Ah. And every St. David's Day, the 1st of March, he has now taken to writing the formal updates. And last year, he added in the liminal zone. Ooh, right. And it kind of looks a little bit like this. 
it's this green area. Now, liminal means that you're suspended in that state between two states. That uh, will be a good analogy. So the wedding march has started, the back doors of the church has op have opened, and the bride is walking up the aisle on the arm of her father giving her away. That's kind of a liminal state. It's like there, the ceremony has started, but she's not yet married. The groom's at the front with that thousand yard stare. Oh my goodness me, it's today. He's committed, so's she, but they're not yet married. Um, what else? Well, we can cover we can cover other examples as we go through talking about it a bit more. There were a couple of other slight refinements to come though, but this liminal one was one of the biggest. And the big refinements came this year. St. David's Day again was a major update and a couple of things got added in and it went deeper and deeper from them. Obvious became called clear. Now this makes it a little bit more mnemonic that all of these major domains now begin with a C. Emergent practice became known as exaptive practice. Now exaptation uh, is a concept that actually came out of evolutionary biology. Um, so you can really understand it. Um, adaptation um, in evolutionary biology describes a feature that's produced by natural selection for its, for its current function. So something like echolocation in bats. You know, a squillion years ago, uh, the squeakier bat did a better job of surviving. And as time went by, the squeaky bats with the big ears did better jobs of surviving. And one thing led to another, and eventually you have echolocation. That's adaptation. Exaptation, uh, an exaptive feature, is a feature that performs a function, but it wasn't produced by natural selection for that use. So the classic example is feathers. It's now generally believed that feathers originally turned up as thermal insulation, a bit like fur. But then sure enough, you can just imagine a little tiny dinosaur with some little tiny stubby feathers on it falling out of a tree. And it was the one that survived where its nest mates didn't. And fast forward a squillion years, you have birds. Um, what's a more mundane, prosaic example? Um, so I used to be a cabinet maker and I have a thing about tools. And I'd be willing, if I really needed a tiny narrow screwdriver, to adapt an existing bigger screwdriver by grinding down the tip. That's adaptation. Every now and then, however, I'd see somebody take one of my precious screwdrivers and uh, adopt an exaptive use for it to pry open a can of paint, which usually got me a little upset and still does. I'm feeling a little teary just thinking about it now. But that's exaptation. It's taking something and using it for something that it wasn't originally designed for, right? So this is actually kind of a key notion that over in the world of complexity, we can't really know ahead of time how things are going to go. As you, as you tinker with the constraints, you may find that you can already use something that exists for a slightly different purpose to get towards the outcome that you're after. Now, here's the biggest refinement. That area in the middle that used to be called disorder, that had always been kind of a little bit of a thorn in the side of Kenevin. Um, and it was really over the last year to 18 months that a lot of thought was paid to disorder. And it's now at, it, at its simplest, if we just did the four domains, we didn't worry about liminal, we'd call that area in the middle confused. If we add in this liminal curve that as you can see, goes right through it, we have this aspect called apparetic. They, they, you love these jargon terms. You can show off with these, right? Uh, and in a way we use them specifically to make sure that people go, I don't know what that means and you have to explain it because otherwise it's terribly easy to use terms and people think they know what you're talking about and God bless them, they're actually thinking about something else. Apparetic. Um, apparetic, um, well, let me dig into it in a lot more detail. Um, it's kind of like 
aware, all right? Now, originally that area was called disorder and we'd already distinguished that it could be an authentic disorder or an inauthentic disorder. Authentic disorder basically meant that you knew that you didn't know what was going on. You didn't know which of the domains applied to your situation, right? Inauthentic disorder meant that maybe you were pretending you didn't know, or you had a situation like, you know, the boss goes, I know what to do, just go and, and do this. And all of the experts employed by the boss are going, oh dear Lord, that's the worst possible thing to do. But nonetheless, they go ahead and do it. That's an inauthentic state of disorder. Apparetic, or if you want to keep the word simple, aware. Apparetic is a state of mind where we embrace contradiction and we actually suspend resolution to ensure that we get a resilient outcome. And that's slightly different to just regular confused. Let me give you some examples that I, I stole from the blog of uh, the wonderful Zhen Go. She's another one of the cognitive age people. Here we go, aporia, an expression of real or pretended doubt or uncertainty, especially for rhetorical effect. That's another one of the definitions. Governor Cuomo, back before the pandemic, I don't know whether I'd have agreed with his politics, but he's certainly shown up as being both a leader and a manager in the way that we talked about right at the beginning. I, to quote this, Governor Cuomo's approach has one support because it displays a balance between taking charge and managing, good fellow, whilst maintaining humility, opening up the space for participation and consistent acknowledgement of the situation. Let's practice humanity together. He knew that he didn't know how to handle this, that almost nobody knew how to handle it, and he wasn't gonna hide that. Even better, we have the splendid Jacinda Ardern, the, the um, Prime Minister of New Zealand. Oh, she's done such a good job. If you have any questions about what you can or can't do, and you're looking for answers, apply a simple principle. Act like you have COVID-19. Every move you make could be a risk to someone else. Absolutely perfect apparatic response. She's quite deliberately going, look, we don't know. So there must be something wise that we can do while we're figuring it out. But let's not pretend that we do know what we're doing until we've actually figured it out. Uh, let me give you a third example. Uh, this is a guy I didn't know before I came across these. Uh, Arn Sorensen, the CEO of Marriott International, who had to address his guys to explain his cancer. We've never had a more difficult moment than this one. There is simply nothing worse than telling highly valued associates that their roles are being impacted by events completely outside of their control. Uh, take something. I mean, if you're a CEO, everybody will be looking to you. And to actually be somebody that goes, I'm sorry, my illness is causing a situation where we have no control. Good. That's authentic. Now let's contrast that with just raw confusion, being perplexed or disconcerted, disoriented with regard to one's sense of time, place, or identity. Uh, you can have a little bet with yourself as to where I'm going next. This should not be a surprise. I'm going to quote The Onion to you, and uh, I sincerely hope that all of you are familiar with The Onion, America's finest news source. No, it's not. It's all satire. All right. Trump claims to have stopped taking hydroxychloroquine. In an interview with this past Sunday, President Trump claimed he has completed a regimen of hydroxychloroquine, blah, 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 blah. What do you think? I do love the onions. What do you think? It's just brilliant. Let, let me, I, it's a little tiny, so I'll read them out to you. Uh, first quote, taking part in drug trials is a good way to make some extra cash. Eugene Vergara, air conditioning advocate. Well, I never believed he started taking it, so good luck getting me to believe he stopped. Christian Cordill, high-end librarian. Oh, there's not really any reason to take it now that coronavirus is gone. Greater Myers, flower bagger. Thank you, Onion. An absolutely sublime example, even if satire, as to what actual confusion, foolish, perplexed, disconcerted confusion looks like. Absolutely perfect. 
Now let's go a little bit deeper into this. So if we zoom right in, let's take a close look at it. If you're in a state of aporia or confusion, what are you gonna do about that? Well, there are some moves that you can make. Um, the first one, which is kind of the default, is you'd probably want to shift towards complexity. Something just to call out, we're talking here not about the complexity of physics, we're talking about the comp complexity of uh, organic and organizational systems, human complexity, anthro complexity, right? And that's actually kind of the natural state for most human systems to be in. They're complex adaptive systems. So actually it's kind of the lowest energy level to be in if you're talking about a, a, an anthro complex system. If you're talking about a physical system, then the lowest state is actually chaos. You know, um, that's what uh, entropy is all about. Anyhow, to get out of an apparatic or confused state into complexity, um, you want to take the approach of acknowledging you may need hy multiple hypotheses. Um, if you've got them and you can't resolve them in a reasonable time for decision making, that's also proof that you're moving across into complexity, right? There's a whole bunch of methods and tools that you can use. I'll touch on a couple of them before the evening's over. Now, the next one is to just shift it into complicated by basically just, you understand enough to know the experts to turn to, right? You can actually commission research, you could get some analysis. Um, you could say that an, an awful lot of the wiser responses to the, the pandemic have been a mix of these two that you know, wiser nations have gone, oh my goodness me, this is something we completely have to put into the hands of medicine. Um, nations that really didn't have that available to them took more complex approaches. Um, did you guys hear about Mongolia? Mongolia actually has the most successful response. Um, as soon as the coronavirus showed up, Mongolia, which is only tiny, but Ulaanbaatar, the, the um, capital city, still a million and a half people, and they immediately went, we, we can't fight this. So they basically said, everybody, masks on. Um, that's it, you can't do anything else. You've got to have masks on and we're gonna start contact tracing right away. Not only were there no deaths, there was no referred contagion in Mongolia. Pretty slick, right? Well, that's a good example of an entire country going, we don't know look, we'll just take some kind of action, right? The next move that we have, this is to actually go into the, the, so the complex chaotic boundary, the liminal boundary. And Andrew? The, yeah. Just to clarify that that action that they took was to acquire more information. Yes. Or that action that they did, and to reduce risk and acquire information. That's exactly right, that's exactly right, yes. So, to move into this chaotic, complex liminal zone, what that actually means is that you're going, ah, we kind of need to open this up, right? And typically what that looks like is you then start to deal with broad cognitive diversity. You start to gather information from as many people and as many sources as you possibly can. So you can start to see where there's group think, where there's consensus, where there's weak signals and outliers. And you're actually getting a whole bunch more data that you can now pay attention to and then act on, right? So this is definitely another move that we've seen major nations take. Now here's a sneaky kind of subtle one, this move into the liminal zone of the complicated air, um, domain. What does that mean? It actually means going, look, we need to come at this sideways. If you took the second move straight into complicated, that's like going, it's a medical problem, we'll talk to the doctors. Taking this move into the liminal zone is going, huh, this is a problem. What other areas of expertise might have an interesting but orthogonal look at this? Could we go to, I don't know, engineering? Could we go to law? I don't know. Um, there's, in, in less stressful circumstances, 
Um, this is a, a trick that you see often being played when you see an organization that sets up maybe a skunk, skunk works. Um, you want to put together a team of people that includes some naivety about the subject that you're dealing with so that people come up with radically unusual ideas, right? Now, the last one, this is unfortunately the one that we saw happen here in America and in Britain and in Australia, which is the really, really risky shift from any area to do with confusion straight into clear. This is the hydroxychloroquine effect. This is someone going, oh, oh, well, it's bloody obvious, isn't it? You take this drug and you'll be fine, she'll be right. Whereupon people who just long for certainty will go, oh, thank goodness. Oh, good, we can take the drug. The downside is that it actually generates way more risk and can actually lead straight round into chaos, right? It is not a safe move. And yet, of course, this is the one that we've seen recently. So it's been very timely that over the last 18 months or so, this kind of understanding has come up. Uh, and actually, I mean, I, a lot of what I learned over these, these last three weeks was had to do with um, Dave Snowden being involved with the European Commission and their crisis response document that they've now got well established um, in collaboration with him. And a lot of it is about how you actually make these kinds of moves um, when you're dealing with crises that actually affect entire nations, if not continents. Andrew, right. so, yes. Come back. Um, interesting because um, on the one hand, um, in the chaotic, the argument is you act first. Mm -hmm. So why was it in the example you just quoted, um, hey, let's, let's take hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> it's a devil, isn't it? That one, yeah. yeah. Um, that, why was that not thought to be actually going towards chaotic? Because the assumption being that you act in many ways, none of them necessarily have, would, yeah. And um, would, none of them would give you, guarantee you any um, stable outcome. No, no, very good. I, I'll actually kind of cover some of this. Oh, that's really good. Um, but no, I mean, the, the, the difference is that uh, an action from chaos would be to regain control. The hydroxychloroquine thing was an action from foolishness and hubris. And it was not to gain control. The cynics among, well, I'll, let, I'll get onto that. I'll get onto that. But good, good. Thank you for bringing that up. Now, having a look at those moves actually brings up uh, the second aspect of Kinevin. The shallowest understanding of it is that you can think of it as being order versus complexity versus chaos. But that's like a static framework of domains. There's another framework, which is the, the dynamics framework, the moves between the domains. And so we kind of got started with that, looking at all of those moves from AC out into the other domains. So let's take a quick look at some of these. Now, the first one, which will actually be familiar to all of us, particularly if we work in technology, is this, this blue cycle. Uh, if I could have animated this a bit better, you'd see it sort of rotating. Um, it's the, the, the set of moves between complex and complicated. Ideas emerge in complex from your experiments, uh, from the exaptive practice, right? And those that look like they're achieving some degree of stability and predictability, you might move across into the complicated realm. Uh, if they don't achieve repeatability, but all right, then back you go, you go back to complex and you have another iteration. Any of us who are familiar with Agile would go, oh, that's what we're doing. It's that cycle there. And in fact, really the, the liminal zone there could be much broader because it's actually kind of wise to keep yourself in that betwixt and between state for as long as possible. Um, I think the best place to think about that is when you're thinking, say, 
uh, about what a product owner is doing is they're narrowing down the options before actually proposing a story that they could refine with the team. So by the time they've got to the team, they've probably gone, I think we can move this into the complicated realm where my experts can turn it into something. And then our testing and our feedback will actually show whether that works out or not. And if it doesn't, well, back it goes and we'll refine it and we'll take it back into complex. All right. There is a danger there that if you get complacent, that you do something and it seems to work once, you're like, oh, sweet, it's done. And you don't go back to complex. And there's typically a bit of a cadence in there. And um, I'll talk more about cadence a little bit later as well, because cadence is, in, is one of the aspects of this whole thing of going, huh, in what sort of time scale or how often do we actually make these moves? Let me show you the next one, this yellow one. Now let's say that you've got a bit of a blue dynamic going, but it's, it's not really working, that maybe things are getting a little bit stuck over in complicated, right? It's actually got a little bit stable that maybe this could be a scrum team that's starting to be like, eh, well, we know scrum. I don't know why we should keep doing it. <laughs> and you might want to go if you're an agile coach. Well, all right, let's have a retro and walk them through one of those fabulous agile exercises that introduces a little bit of chaos, right? That shakes things up a little bit and disrupts. Right, just a shallow little dive in it, just something to have people go, oh, oh, oh no, we were getting a bit complacent. We were getting a bit stuck in our ways. Right, let's have a bit of a reset and maybe we can go back to that blue dynamic, right? So Andrew, mm -hmm. I know about uh, the technical example of that that comes to mind is the, the monkey screwdriver or monkey wrench, whatever it is, project at Netflix where they're constantly Chaos having, monkeys. Uh, chaos monkeys, where they're constantly yep. having attacks on the infrastructure and the network so that they know to be able to deal with it and it's randomized. Yeah. How do you, would you do that with on, on the uh, granularity of a scrum team? Um, write that or maybe down. if you could address some of those exercises. Yeah. yeah, write that down. If it doesn't get properly discussed, consider that to be a parking lot item and we'll deal with that in the time we've got at the end. Sound good? Sounds great. Cool. All right, let's keep going. Now here we have um, this move, which may not happen for many things, a small percentage of things where you can actually shift them from complicated down into clear. This is kind of the domain of DevOps, kind of. Um, that it has an end, an end state implied by the arrow doesn't mean that getting everything into clear is your goal. Um, none of these domains are any more important than any of the others, all right? They're all contextual. But it's worth showing this move and showing that it's sort of steering across and away from that boundary between clear and chaotic. And you'll see why in a minute. Then uh, for this set, this is the last one that we look at. Uh, the purple grazing dynamic. This is something that usually happens very quickly, right? It's a, it's, it's a volatile um, dynamic. It's usually not very stable. At best, it's transitional. It's constantly skimming through the edge of complex and chaotic, back into complex, back into complicated, to chaotic. And this is something you do super quick, right? Small, fast interventions. Um, this doesn't map necessarily into Scrum in a dev team, but public health, for example, yeah, they know all about this. Consumer goods, you may notice that you know, Charmin have 57 different varieties of toilet paper. That's kind of what they're doing here. Uh, that's not a very fast iteration, but you, you get the idea. It's about going, let's, let's try this thing. And it's sort of the experts think that that might work and we'll put it over here and we'll put it over there. Facebook, um, I always quote Facebook as having, you know, a delivery cycle of releasing something live to site every 15 seconds or whatever it is. Well, that doesn't mean that there's somebody with a stopwatch going, go. Another 15 seconds, go. No, what it means is that they're always running tons and tons and tons of quick little experiments. I mean, you know, yeah, it's Facebook, they can do that. But the point is that this is a really interesting dynamic for innovation, all right? Now, those are all of the ones that sort of sit and kind of have their source in complex. Sorry, say again. 
Are you saying Facebook is innovative? <laughs> well, there was a time when Facebook was innovative, and I'm probably going to have to update my, my examples for this idea, but... <sighs> we can talk yeah. about that after. We could, couldn't we? <laughs> okay. No, I was thinking about innovative as in like um, the value of innovation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, I mean, let's... That could be in Facebook does a lot of innovation, but has no value to you know mankind. Yeah. Right? yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Let's let's save that one. That might be an after hours rant that we can get into. But yeah, there's there's actually quite a lot in that. Um, put it this way: I, I've now put in probably somewhere in the region of about. 80 contact hours with the Cognitive Edge guys to get to here. Um, and that's because all of this stuff, typically you want to pick up on a conversation like the one you were just hinting at and you'll, you know, you unpack it and you discover that there's a great deal in there. Uh, we don't have that time tonight. This is just a scoot through. And if it leaves you wanting to know more, well, and we don't cover it afterwards, ping me. Um, we can dig into this a lot deeper over time. Let me keep going because there's more to this. Here's one that you really want to look out for, collapse. This is typically caused by the complacency, sabotage, or stubbornness. Now, complacency, we always quote Kodak. You know, it was one of their guys who actually came up with the patent for digital photography, digital imaging. But they just didn't see it. They were like, well, no. Um, Film is the thing. What well, you know, it's going to be a flash in the pan. This digital thing. Oops. It's some. Um, it's kind of where you're walking up to the edge of the cliff, and you're you're actually got your head in your iPhone. You didn't notice that you're about to walk off the cliff, right? Um, it can be stubbornness. There's an example given that the Catholic Church actually agreed with Galileo about his observations, right? But they were like, well, yeah, but look, um. We want to maintain appearances. So, you know, we're not going to put you in jail, torture you, do anything nasty to you, as long as you just shut up for now. Okay? And that did not work out particularly well when the entire sort of enlightenment and scientific revolution kicked off. And everybody's going, why, do, why didn't you say something? All right? This is the most energetically expensive uh, migration across boundaries. Right? And it's worth noting that's why this boundary is typically drawn with this big thick curve. That's why one of those early versions of it looked like a fold in a napkin. All right? There is a contrary move of imposition. Well, this is typically draconian. And what these two moves put together point to is the dictator's playbook. Most dictators know full well that if you cause chaos and you have the resources to then enforce stability and rigidity, that's how you gain power. And it, we are living, boy, in interesting times because I mean, looking at this last week, 10 days, we are teetering right on the edge of all of this, right? This is really worthwhile having this stuff at the forefront of your mind right now. It can be the kind of imposition that's applied benignly. If you've ever watched a, a great primary school teacher regain order in a classroom full of kids hopped up on sugar, well, that's this move. But it takes something. It takes a lot of investment, a lot of energy to make this move, right? Now, the next one is the sort of iterative and incremental bouncing to and fro between complicated and clear. Um, one of the things that actually was a, a development in this version of the Kinevan framework is you see how this boundary sort of tapers out and it fades out. That's because this is really a continuum. And so this bouncing around here, I think Scrum actually goes very happily across this boundary as well. That whole iterative and incremental, well, you know, our experts have done it. Now we're going to deliver it. And people are using it. And it works for them. But, oh, look, we learned something else that's added to our expertise. Let's do another iteration and increment a bit more and put it back oh, and learn something else. Right? That's what's going on there. I think you could argue that Kaizen fits in there. Continuous slight improvement. That possibly fits across the 
complex, complicated boundary as well. I'm actually, I'm actually not sure about that, but it's worth thinking about. Now, um, a slight variant on where we would usually have that blue dynamic is this one. We've got exploration where you deliberately move across into complex, right? This is kind of where scientific method applies. Scientific method applies all over the place in here, right? Taking your experts and putting them into the complex domain to seek something unpredictable, again, it's a source of innovation, right? You might do this by setting up the conditions to encourage informal networks and communities in the workplace, right? Something very lightly monitored. Um, I think it was Apple that put um, barriers into their canteen. I don't know, I've never actually been into any of uh, Apple's um, canteens. And they did that specifically to force people to queue up and zigzag to and fro, so they might have serendipitous conversations. That's very much what this move is about, is setting up the conditions for serendipity, all right? And then once you've come up with something, you want to move it the other way to exploit it. And by exploit, I mean, do something useful with it. Um, this is also kind of that move, the exploitation move has also been known as the just in time move, because when you apply it to value chains, that's the kind of thinking that came from people going, wow, we've got all of this stock that our experts told us we should have available. It's actually making a real mess of things because all of this capital is tied up in it. Huh, what could we do that would be radically different? And just in time came out of that. Although somebody came up with something glorious a while back, looking at the results of just in time with our supply chains right now, went maybe we should start to think about just in case as a wise alternative to just in time. Anyhow, moving on. Now the next one, this one's actually called swarming. Now imagine if you will, that you're in a cinema and the fire alarm goes off. You're going to look for something that you would associate with safety. And these are what we would call attractors. People would move towards the attractors. If anybody's thinking fire, I need a fire hydrant and look for one inside the, the cinema, they may be disappointed. If I'm on, someone's like, oh, I wanna be safe and they're looking for a lifesaver, that's well, not gonna go so well. But if maybe somebody shouted, go to the exit where the green light is, that exit sign would then be a really good strong attractor, right? And that would then allow people to do what they knew to do. If you could get out of the cinema, you'd be like, oh, right, yeah, no, go and meet in the parking lot. Look for emergency services, right? That's a move that you can actually deliberately set up by paying attention to those attractors, right? Those are the conditions that you need so that should something show up in the chaotic, you've actually got some kind of response ready. All right, let me move on. I'm bit more, I want to get through a bit more of this. Divergence, convergence. Actually deliberately sitting on that boundary, that's the happy hunting ground of startups, of the lean startup movement, of using disruption to innovate. That's kind of what we are pointing to when we're talking about the move from apparatic into that liminal zone, right? This boundary is kind of a bit permeable. There is an energy investment in moving to and fro across it but it's an easy one to move through if conditions allow it. And that, by that I mean that you're a small, flexible organization. If you're a big, clunking, hidebound, very hierarchical organization, you're gonna have trouble here, even if you're good at maybe navigating across complicated and clear, all right? So that's a whole set of moves, the, the Kinevin dynamics. Now, I want to just show you this last little set, which is just designed specifically to exploit chaos. Now, this first one I've already hinted at, entrainment breaking. Entrainment is that phenomena where you're stuck in your thinking. Um, you know, I actually think this is something that we should do on a regular basis with a lot of engineering teams. The people quite regularly are like, well, I'm an expert, I know what I'm doing, just give me the problem and I'll figure it out, which is complicated thinking. But if your problems are complex, your complicated thinking may not get you anywhere, right? So again, any of us agilists would be like, oh yeah, there's all kinds of games that we play, exercises that we run that are designed to do this. The ballpoint game, that classic, 
that exactly does this. You give people a ballpoint game. Initially, they're like, what the hell? And then they have a go and they discover that they're sort of suspended in this state between chaos and complexity as they start to experiment. And then they experiment and they experiment and they see things working and they do more of what works. And lo and behold, by the end of the ballpoint game, you've got back to things where they're like, yeah, we kind of know how this works. All right. Now the next one, this move is called liberation, right? And uh, this is a move where you sort of graze from clear where everybody's like, oh, this, this is the way it's been done forever. You dodge them just through a tiny little bit of chaotic, through a bit of complexity. Really, again, this is a shake them up move to get people going, oh, no, yeah, we'd forgotten, we're experts. Yeah, actually, let's go and find something new. Let's go and, and do something a little bit bonkers, and then we'll, we'll analyze it and see whether we can move something maybe eventually back into clear. All right, so this is, a, again, a getting unstuck move. And then the last one, this is one of my absolute favorites, this little immunization, this dip into chaos and back again. You think of those kind of news stories that you come across where, I don't know, um, or you see this in the movies all the time, where a stuffy old character uh, has a, a brush with death and comes back transformed and enlivened. Um, there's, there's a story that Buster Keaton, you know Buster Keaton, the brilliant old black and white comedian, who used to do all of his own stunts and they were terrifying. And apparently he was willing to do this and knew that he could do it because as a child, as a baby, he'd been picked up by a tornado and safely deposited back down again. So in his world, he was like, chaos, schmaus, I can handle that. And used to do those incredible stunts. Kind of cool. Andrew, and, yes. These moves, all these moves. Yeah. Is this the latest thinking? Because, uh, because while back, um, the thinking of that you couldn't move from the chaotic to simple because of that mm. that cliff drop. The cliff, yeah. Cliff, and you can't just climb out of it. And then the other part, going through what is now called. AC or confused, right? That in that confused state, you don't really know right. where you are. So trying to navigate there, it's it's like going through a storm. Yeah. And and yeah. And so so question. Yeah. That how can you uh, premeditate a move through these space through these um, good. Yep. Through these spaces? Yep. Got it. All right. Stick it into chat. We'll come back to it. This is going to take me a couple more minutes just to get through to the, the, the things that we will need to answer that question. All right. That's really good. And by the way, if you want to think about that cliff, uh, the thinking about a lot of it comes from catastrophe theory. And remind me to come back and talk about that when we actually get to, you know, answering questions. It's, uh, it's a whole thing, but it really actually sh sh throws insight into what's going on on that boundary between clear and chaos. You see, do you remember I said early on that a lot of this has to do with constraints? Now we have a topology of constraints that looks like this. You have containers, boundaries, and you have couplers, connectors, right? And either of them may be robust or resilient. And let me say a bit more about that. Robust could be rigid, where there is absolutely, there's no flexibility in it whatsoever. The example that's always given for a robust container would be a sea wall, which keeps the sea at bay until it breaks. And the trouble with a rigid container is that typically you've got more trouble than it was worth if it breaks, right? Elastic. Well, we've all got like elastic sided, elastic sided pants and they can persuade us that we're not gaining weight until finally the disaster of the elastic giving way or you're not being able to get your pants on. And then there's tethers. Tethers are things like um, chains or leashes. Now get that this is all analogies, all right? But a chain's a good example. If any of you ever saw the great movie, American Graffiti, there's the scene where the car shoots past the, the cops and the cops set off after it, unaware that their rear axle was chained to a building and it tears the rear axle right off. 
that's the trouble with a tether. If you have a, a tether constraint where you actually take up the slack and it can then hold things and that can be useful. But if you don't take up the slack, it can actually cause damage. And that's the trouble with things that are robust, that they're fine until they break. Whereas resilience tends not to break. If it's a container, you think of it as being permeable. If it's a cup, it would be more condition, conditional. Uh, under some conditions, these things apply. Under others, they don't, right? Um, so uh, what's a good permeable one? Oh, um, in contrast to the seawall, um, uh, salt marsh. You know, the tide comes in, the salt marsh floods. It doesn't care. This caused no damage. The tide goes out and the salt marsh drains. It is unaffected, but it's soaked up all of that extra water and then released it again. You've got mutating constraints. Now, an example for that might be um, case law, where precedents will alter the law, right? This is fairly rare. It's certainly rare in organizations, but I was thinking about definitions of done that a definition of done that's written using Moscow, must, should, could, and won't, that's probably a pretty good conditional set of constraints. And any team worth their salt would keep asking, do we want to update our definition of done, making it mutating constraints. They're also probably fairly elastic. But again, if you, if you ignore them and overstretch them, and do something damn fool in a sprint that breaks things, well, there you go. Then lastly, we have dark constraints. And these are constraints which constrain you, but you're not really aware of them except with hindsight. And we could actually think of culture, organizational culture, as being a dark constraint. It's almost a complex system of its own. right? And one of the, the challenges that we have for all of these things is how could one go about affecting that in a way that actually makes a contribution? Right. So let me keep going. I'm aware of time and there's still a little bit more that I want to go through and it's still of value. If any of you saw the original presentation that I gave to sort of introduce us to the basics of Kinevin, you'd remember this. Safe to fail experiments, you want to run them in parallel to move from complex into complicated. But that first question, what can we change, you can now refine. What constraints can we change? Right? And then you can ask the other questions of the constraints we can change, where can we monitor the impact, and where we can monitor, can we amplify success or recover from failure, right? But it's constraints that are the things you're actually going to change, right? Now, there's a little bit more. This is a different kind of constraint, and this is brand spanking new thinking. Um, scaffolding. Scaffolding is a metaphor. There's impermanent scaffolding. I get these, these are metaphors, but this is, this is really helpful for thinking about organizational design, organizational intervention, right? Impermanent scaffolding is like building scaffolding. It's the kind of scaffolding that you would put up to deliver men and materials to the structure as it's put in place. It would also include form work, the kind of scaffolding that actually supports and defines the shape of the structure that you're putting together. And it leads to this question, how do we design organizations where roles and job descriptions are impermanent scaffolds for emergent and adaptive hierarchies? Now hierarchy, by the way, is necessary. A rigid hierarchy might be necessary for governance and for managing an organization. But most of the actual knowledge and work happens in organizations in informal networks and hierarchies. And those tend to be emergent and adaptive. Now, neural lattice. A neural lattice, this is so cool. This comes from medicine. Uh, a neural lattice is basically something um, that would get installed, for example, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a sort of bionic device that's installed into cardiac tissue. And as the cardiac tissue repairs itself, it incorporates the neural lattice, which works as a very low voltage pacemaker, right? So think of it like this. What if frameworks and tools were used as a scaffold, just like that sort of nano patch? I love it. And I, lo I mean, this completely reframed my relationship to Scrum when I came across this idea 
oh you know it's like scrum used well is like a pacemaker for the for the team a very low energy very gentle pacemaker hmm now a nutrient lattice this is the again from medicine this is uh there's all kinds of clever things where nutrient lattices can be applied so over burns and they they help with um uh, skin grafts and with skin regrowth and the nutrients are typically things like collagen um, and they eventually actually get absorbed into and supply the necessary nutrients for the growth right so this is one for us as consultants how would consultants take up their role in organizations differently if they saw themselves as nutrient scaffolds that exist to catalyze and enable internal capability ha that's oh, that's so interesting. There are all kinds of approaches I've seen to consulting. My my least favorite would be those that go in and go, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. They've just got no commitment to their clients, right? They'll show up, they'll run some trainings, up to those guys if they're adopted or not. Then there's the acknowledgement that for an awful lot of, of consultants, it's a short gig. Even if you're employed full time, maybe you're just going to be there for two or three years. So hardly anybody stays there for life now. So there may be that whole thing of going, well, look, if somebody asks me an interesting question, I don't know whether I'm going to give a full answer. I'm going to give away my secrets. Huh. So how about if you reframed all of that into going, no, 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 my job is to actually install all of those secrets here and leave them as a nutrient that will actually help to grow this organization. We have shadow scaffolding and shadow scaffolding again it's that's again it's very much like culture. You can't actually identify what it is that's supporting this shape but it's there and you may have to have been there and been working with it before you can actually go oh that's what was going on. Uh, let me talk about keystone and then we'll ask a question about shadow as well keystone scaffolding well that's just like the keystones that you drop into place at the top of an arch this is something that until it's in place the structure cannot support itself so you might use an impermanent scaffold to get it to a certain point and then you drop in the keystone so how do we nurture networks interactions and tacit knowledge that preserve shadow and keystone scaffolds there are certainly functions within organizations which are keystones. I'm, I'm reminded of the story, more than one story I've heard, where, for example, well, somebody got fired from a team because the manager couldn't really identify what it was that they were contributing. And the team then collapses and goes back to the manager going, gee, she was the one constant, she was somebody that we could always talk to. And I know she didn't do much work, but she held us together. Oh, she was the keystone. And she was actually maybe operating as a shadow scaffolding as well. There's an interesting example of work that was done with the British nuclear agency, I can't remember what they called, which was rather in the grip of the accountants. They wanted to fire about 50% of the staff. Some analysis was done uh, and it actually revealed the amount of embedded knowledge that would have been lost if they'd fired 50% of the staff, that they'd have actually made the nuclear power facilities in Britain almost impossible to run if they'd done this. In fact, it revealed more than that. It revealed the risk that they were at from the few experts they had. And they ended up not halving their workforce, but doubling it because they actually got to understand what it was that was propping up that organization. All right, so scaffolding is another kind of constraint. I think of it almost as being like contextual constraints, although you could think of all constraints as contextual and all contexts as being constraints. So we're pretty much there in summary. I'm not gonna actually go through all of these last slides because I'm gonna give all of this to you as a reference. Many of you will have seen all of these reference bits before, and it's really just a summary of things, granularity, um, I've just touched on that really briefly. You may want to chunk up to very high levels of abstraction to set direction and to get a sense of context. But when you want to go into action and understand what to do, you want to go back down to much finer levels of granularity, right? 
disintermediation, by the way, I'll just say something about that because it's an unfamiliar term. Don't put any distance between the decision and its impact, right? Um, I think I showed you originally the wonderful x-ray of somebody having swallowed a spoon, that when they're complaining of a stomach ache, that it could have led to surgery had somebody, you know, or just ignoring it, had somebody not run them through an x-ray and seen that there was a spoon in there. Actually, it probably did lead to surgery. I don't know how else you get a spoon out. Uh, the premature convergence, yes, your first idea is not your best idea. All of these, the hard part. You've got to gather your data and actually see to, that it's there to be able to pay attention to it and act on it. That's exactly what was happening with the British Nuclear Agency. The accountants had one set of data, but they hadn't gathered all of it and they weren't paying attention to it until they did. All right. And then they had something to act on. Okay, I think we're there. That's it. There you are. There's an image of Kanevin just to wrap us up. And as ever, those are all of my contact details. You're going to get a copy of this. But I want to draw your attention to just one thing. I've got that motto on there. Know what to do when you don't know what to do. And I hope that by now you can see why I've been saying that and using that for a long time. Because basically, what I'm talking about there is Kenevin. Right? Do you remember at the beginning I said that all decisions are impossible decisions? Right? If you have to make a decision, it's acknowledging that you don't know what to do. And Kenevin is exactly what you do about that. All right, guys, I'm going to bring myself back. I'm stopping the share. And we have a few minutes now to be able to dig into questions if you're interested in that. So hang on, let me just get out of your old PowerPoint. There we go. And let me get over here and have a look at our chat. Um, Oh, good. What exercises are there to introduce chaos into a scrum team during a retro? Um, gosh, well, really simple. Really simple. My favorite first retro to run with anybody that's never done a retro before, and that's scary how many teams are like that, is to simply go, all right, well, look, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, I do the five, you know, explain the five steps that we're going to go through, which in itself, is the first step. It sets the stage for them. Then I'll go, right, um, everybody take some stickies and a Sharpie. I'd like you to write down anything that's important that's come up during the sprint, uh, anything that's, that was troublesome, anything good, anything that was on your mind, anything that needed resolved. But I need you to do that in silence, please. And almost every time I've done that, people are like, oh, what? And it actually throws them into a mild state of chaos. They're used to being asked to talk about things, right? And once they've done it for a bit and you see it slowing down, then you actually move on to the next step of you get it all up onto a board and you start to do affinity mapping and you get them talking and they keep adding stickies. And that now pulls them back into complex where they're starting to see things emerge and they're starting to see patterns that they hadn't seen before so that then you can move on to the fourth step of decide what to do, uh, which is now moving back across into complicated. And then you wrap up and close, making sure that everybody knows who's expected to do what and by when, how to report success, how to manage risk of failure. That's actually, you've got to leave them kind of clear at the end of it. So there's a real distinct move there. I, I promise you, if you go and spend time on dear old tasty cupcakes or look at Fiagi's work or um, look at oh, any of the games that we play as Agilists, you'll see that they, all of them, certainly the most effective, are making these moves. And trust me, that will then alter how you apply these games because a lot of them are described just to like recipes. Well, please do not be a recipe follower. Become a chef, right? A chef really doesn't need to follow the recipes because they actually understand the deep science of what happens when you apply uh, friction and blades and heat and time to all of those fabulous ingredients, right? As opposed to somebody that reads the recipe. I'm gonna contradict a little bit. Go ahead. First, you need to follow a recipe in order to become a chef. Yes, you do. So, 
Yes. So what your point is, yes, to experiment, um, follow recipe as much as possible, but be open to putting your own ingredients in it. Yeah, and, and ask the questions like Edward just asked you, if you follow the recipe and go, huh, I wonder why I have to get the pan hot first before I put the oil in. Why would that make a difference? And then the next thing you know, you're starting to actually learn about the science of cookery and you're starting to get there to be a chef. Um, I love watching the Great British Baking Show, but I really want to know more about what's going on in the judges' minds. I really want to understand exactly where they're coming from when they're you see them explain different ways of kneading different flowers under different circumstances. I'm like, how do you know that? That's amazing. That's what I'm talking about for you guys as agilists. When you start to understand Canavin, a little bit of complexity science, it really, really, it just opens up this world of being able to go, oh, there are constraints. <laughs> what if we change these constraints? Right? Now, what are, there are a couple of other things that came up. Guys, I'm sorry, I wasn't taking notes as I went through. Um, I was just wanting to get through, through to the end because a lot of this material, I finished the PowerPoint maybe an hour ago, yeah. right? So you know how it is. So yeah. what, what else was that came up? Tarang, yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, mate. What came up was about um, the moves and going through what is now called AC, but what was called disorder. Mm -hmm. thinking that once you get into disorder, it becomes um, uh, disorienting. Yeah. It's unlike chaotic, it's, it's much more disorienting and therefore, how do you go through it? It's, uh, and, and that kind of notion. Um, yeah. There's a couple of questions and then that, that cliff edge, how do you get off, the, get on? If the, if the latest thing, the, the original thinking was you could never get back from chaotic to simple. You have to actually go through the other spaces, if you will. Yeah. Because yeah. that cliff is, takes it, not a, yeah. a lot of energy to move across. So, for example, Kodak. Kodak's yeah. a good example. Yeah. Kodak, um, when, it, when it recognized that it was a, a failing, and it was in, in a sense, in that chaotic space that every move they tried to make was towards more simple. Let's just do the simple thing. Yeah. Yeah. And each time they did them, they failed on them. Yes. Yes, they did. Sure. So sure enough, they fell off that cliff. Now, actually, there's been a bit of a misconception that, that you can't climb back up. You can. It just takes a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very wisely, Kodak, although they their share prices crashed and they became tiny. Um, I believe they're now a research lab. I don't know if anybody knows more about them. Um, no, they something. went bankrupt and they came back and they went bankrupt again. And oh, so did they? The only thing remains is the name. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, let, let me explain catastrophe theory. Um, I first came across catastrophe theory, oh, many years ago. I saw a little documentary about it on the BBC back when I lived back in the old country. Uh, and it was described this way. I think it originated with research into how old fashioned telephone switchboard operators could cope, right? And what they were finding was that, you know, an experienced switchboard operator could handle, you know, one call a minute, two calls a minute, five calls a minute, 10, 20, but at 50, <laughs> ah, she fell off the edge. And then she had to go back to like 10. And then she had to build back up again. And it's this S-shaped curve. It's like, you know, what she's dealing with, what she's dealing with builds and builds and builds and builds. Yeah, boink. No, and then she has to come back down before she can go, oh, now I can manage again, right? So that's kind of, of what you're looking at. And a, a catastrophe curve, uh, I wonder if I can do it in a piece of paper. It's It's... It's like, kind of like that, right? Now you can fold a piece of paper so it's actually almost flat at the other end. And there's really not much gradient there, but at this end, it's very steep indeed, right? So um, the, the deeper your complacency and the more that you insist things are so, 
when the context is shifting and shifting and shifting and shifting and shifting, the greater the drop off that cliff and the greater the investment to come back up again, right? So there's a lot more to catastrophe theory, but if you, if you Google it, you'll find some fabulous stuff on Wikipedia. It's one of those many little things which nerds like us can happily spend an hour or so digging into. But the other question I had was yeah. one of your slides where you show expectation. Exaptation. I never can say that word. Exaptation. <laughs> right. So if you adaptation, ad, aptation, ex, aptation. Yes. Exaptation. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised that, that you it, it's framed in the complex space because you would have thought it should be in the chaotic space because at that point the notion being that you're acting and you're looking for anything that will do yeah that will do the you know the screwdriver example yeah yeah right? anything that will work for you um but it was never designed for it and the reason i mentioned that in the in in the david in his when he presented that once he said um he showed an image of in Thailand, uh, there was a, the, you know, there are floods, right? You know, yeah. Tropical country, there are a lot of floods. So they, he showed a, a photograph of a, um, a case of ex, exaptation <laughs> where, <laughs> where an individual, uh, he had, you know, he had got a brand new car. Yeah. He had recently bought furniture and the furniture had arrived in this massive uh, plastic bag. Yeah. <laughs> so what he did, knowing that these floods were coming, he actually drove his car into the massive plastic bag, tied it up. Floods came. That's his brilliant. Car was saved, everybody else's weren't. Yeah. You know, were flooded. So that was an example, and I thought the the only way you you do those things is in that space of chaos where you're you're gonna. Yeah, you see, I think you're right. I, I, don't, I don't think any of these things. To think, well, you know, hey, the plastic bag ain't going to take, you know, you haven't got the analysis going, if you no. will. But I think that's very good. That points to the permeability of that boundary. That uh, sure enough, it's like, ah, you know, I might not have thought of hanging onto the plastic bag, but boy, I'm glad I did. Exactly. Right? That's perfect. I got to act. What can I do? Oh my God, my new car, it's beautiful. The plastic bag, brilliant, yeah. right? You can still use the same kind of thing when you're in the complex space and you're going, oh, this is interesting. I wonder what I could use. I wonder if I can use a hammer as a screwdriver. Well, the, the difference is this. In one, you haven't got much um, room to second guess yourself. You just yeah. don't try. Yeah, yeah. You when you're second guessing yourself or others are second guessing it and therefore you actually abandon the ideas um and before you know before you even yeah experiment. yeah that's the only difference yeah i'll tell you what this is what this is perfect what we're doing right now is a little tiny flavor of what it's like being in one of those cognitive edge sessions where it's like guys go and spend 15 minutes talking about this Oh, I love it. And we're always full of yes, buts and yes, ands. And how does that work? And where else could you apply that? Um, the scaffolding thing. I think that uh, Anne Pendleton Julian was the extraordinary woman who first came up with the idea in about 2017. And um, of course, met Dave. And in 2018, he invited her to the Canavian retreat in Wales, which is the only one of their retreats I actually spent the money and went to. Oh my God, it was fabulous. Up in the Welsh mountains, just glorious. And we actually spent a lot of time talking about scaffolding. In those conversations, there were way more than five types. You can imagine. You so know. The question is, how much of this is realizable in any organization? So even when we think about the Canafin and and how much of that can be, um, how how would you go about framing, uh, yeah, um, the the way you might see the world of work, if you will, yes, uh, opportunity or or uh, you know new, new, new or, or your existing portfolio of products or anything like that. 
uh, and that's one side. And then the other side is when you talk about scaffolding, how much of um, that do you ever get to exercise of saying, I want to set up a new scaffold? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know whether I have any specific answer, but really now being able to ask those questions that previously may have been questions that people never thought to ask. Right. But an example that I can give is, um, let's say that we're going to do a big old release planning. And you can see it coming, and you've got five teams that might be involved with the release planning. And product are trying to get ready for it. So what I might do is, is go, you know what? I think we should hold a workshop. And uh, what I'd like to do is to get everybody into the same room. It needs to be a big old room, please. But let's have each team at their own table. Let's not mix people up. Say, right? And then I would present them with some kind of exercise that would produce some kind of output. Um, there's, there's, oh, we could even hold the retro I was describing. There's an exercise called Future Backwards, um, which is um, a combination of forecasting, backcasting, and sidecasting. Uh, in other words, uh, starting from where you are, you imagine an absolutely perfect future. You imagine the worst possible future. Um, and you work backwards from each one until you see where they join the timeline together maybe not together, that leads to now. And that can sometimes have people go, oh, we just saw something that's completely different as a, a available things for us to deal with in the future. But if you get each team to do that separately, you're actually allowing them to amplify their own local cognitive biases that have developed in that team. And then you're in a position to go, wonderful. Now, guys, what I'd like you to do is a philosopher's walk, please. Uh, I'd like you all to walk the wall have a look at everybody else's work and make a note of what's the same, what's different, and what surprised you, and then be willing to share that. Now that's recruited almost everything that I was describing as we went through to actually have people start to go, oh wow, there's all of these things that we just never noticed. And we always thought that team were a bunch of jerks, but now we see what they're talking about, we kind of get it, and actually we should do something to help them, or whatever it is, right? So. Uh, in the hour that we have here, 90 minutes, or oh, it's nearly that 90 minutes, um, there isn't enough time to go through all of the complex facilitation techniques that Cognitive Edge have designed over the years, and they're very carefully designed using all of this stuff. But this is why it's actually worthwhile. They've got some of the basic techniques available to anybody. You can just jump on the site and have a look. If you want to cough up a couple hundred bucks a year, you can join Cognitive Edge and get their fancy schmancy techniques. Some of them, they're, they're a bit obscure on the site because they're like, yeah, you actually need to be mentored through the first couple of times doing this. You need to see an old hand work their way through it, right? But all of this is applicable and all of it's the kind of thing where you can slide it in and typically you want to know what you're doing without explaining it to them. What I've just done with you guys, I might do with product owners or product managers, but literally nobody else. I might do with managers to disentrain them. We still talk about the permafrost layer, the layer that's fought to get to where it is, but now it doesn't want to relinquish that. It's never going to lead. So it's instead it's going, I'll just maintain my power by not passing everything upstairs or by protecting upstairs. If you walk them through this kind of stuff, it might have them go, oh shit, I'm just getting the impact of how I've been operating. Right. So I'm going to point out, I'm reading um, Jeffrey Moore's new book called Zone to Win. Oh, I haven't read that yet. Yeah. And in, in there, of course, it's got a two by two and... Um, and uh, not to, um, and of course, not to um, put Kanafan in the two by two. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, but I will only in that the there's a in the zone to win the 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 two by two is a way to look at your investments as a company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so whether you're doing innovation or incremental or uh, what you call scaffolding, you know, the, the, uh, scaffolding that maintains the organization uh, mm -hmm. running and so forth. And, uh, and then uh, there's one called transformation. And as, as you were 
going through the Ganefen, you can imagine which one's which, mm -hmm. right? And the, the key takeaway in there was you that at times um, you at any given time you may at most have one thing in transformation, if ever. Yeah, and that's like the chaotic, right? If you think of that way. Um, because it's going to trans be transformative in your business. You can't afford to risk having two things or three things. Try right. right. A, it's bad scientific method. You don't know which one made the difference. And if they interact badly, you're in trouble and you've got no control over it. But at the same time, in the innovation space, you could have many things because they're, they're all experiments. Yep. And in the in incremental, as you pointed out when you did your scrum, yeah. That yeah. one, yeah. yeah. That you're incrementally making changes without, you know, to keep the wheels ticking in your business. Yeah, yeah. So, Refactoring fits there, doesn't it? It's yeah. that's a yeah. So well, the reason I mention that is because for executives to think about their investments in this way allows them to think about how we're going to do our annual planning and portfolio planning and so forth. And why I'm mentioning this is because for years I've been thinking, how do we get, how do you use Kanef and not in the local, of course, the way you mentioned, you know, facilitation sense, mm -hmm. but also in a, in a uh, strategic sense. Good. Yes. I mean, that was actually the theme of this whole three weeks of, of what we we're going over. And there are a couple of major subjects that I'm still digesting that I would love to speak to you guys about. Um, apex predator theory. Um, the, the sim oh, by the way, we've gone past the half hour. So if anybody has a promise to be at dinner at half past eight, you're two minutes late. Sorry. <laughs> but let's go into overtime and keep chatting because this is always good stuff. Um, apex predator theory. Did you hear about the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone? Yes. Yeah. And how it completely transformed the ecosystem. And the short version is that deer were nibbling the grass at the edge of rivers and causing erosion. And um, that meant that the quality of the rivers was, was diminishing and it was impacting all kinds of things. When wolves were introduced, they started to control the deer and the water quality went up and with it all kinds of, of ecological change. Mm -hmm. So from that, and I don't understand this enough to fully recreate it for you, Dave Snowden has developed this apex predator theory, which has a lot to do with sigmoid curves mm -hmm. and recognizing that everything goes through a, a dip as yep. you go, it's a brilliant idea. Oh shit, we're having to invest money in it. Will we ever make anything? Oh yes, we are making something. Yay, it's brilliant. Oh look, we're resting on our laurels. Crap, the market has got away from us. Exactly. Right? right? That you can use apex predator theory to go, oh look, if we stack these sigmoids and ideally as we're identifying where we're coming towards the top of ours, we're looking around at the market, maybe we can jump across to somebody else's building sigmoid and you can actually use Kenevin to give yourself a sense of what situations are where and what interventions could we design to do that. So there's actually a lot that you can use to aid strategy. And David here, you're actually right in the middle of my screen, David Holt, hello. Um, he and I have, have met through uh, um, sitting in on Ben Mosier's instruction around Wardley mapping. And Wardley mapping and Kenevin absolutely go hand in hand. Yeah. You know, they're different views on pretty much the same kind of thing. So, yeah, the short answer is, Tarang, there's a ton that you can bring from this to help with strategy. The long answer is, to do that on the back of a napkin, you really got to know what you're doing, and I'm not there yet. It is I actually have a question. It's the, it's the, it's probably, does David have, David Snowden, did he write a book on this yet? No, but um, these last updates with disorder becoming AC has now had him go, ah, finally this whole thing is coherent. Time allowing, I can now write the book. So time allowing, yeah, yeah, we're kind of familiar with authors who are like, I'm writing a book, I'll get, I'll get right on that. It's nearly finished, and it's been nearly finished for five years, you know. 
So, David, did I hear you say that you had a question? Yeah, I, I do, but um, if the other David has to go and has a question also. Oh, glory, okay. I don't know. Um, in the in the meantime, my, my question, maybe you all know each other well, but um, this is my second time with the group and I was just curious. Um, what is everyone interested and or currently using these frameworks for in their own work? Uh, because I think I may be, I'm not coming from an agile coach background. Uh, so it'd be cool just to kind of hear what folks are interested in. I'll keep quiet in case anybody has anything. I mean, I'll start, um, my background's more in design and product. And I started out being interested in Kinevan because I realized most of the work we were doing was being done uh, as if it were complicated when it was complex. And trying to convince people that it was otherwise was really hard. <laughs> um, and then I sort of also, as part of exploring that, fell into Wardley mapping, which strangely was easier to understand. And that's brought me back into doing more Kinevan research. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested as an Agile coach and trainer, but it, there's something there, there, beyond an intellectual simulation of, hey, we've been thinking about these things in the wrong way. It's, yeah. it's far more, you know, it's, it's not just this one dimensional, simple or complicated, and we don't seem to have as much richer conversation we don't do that right that that's coming from the agile space but i think there is a the strategic planning is what i'm interested in how does it help set up strategic planning and i use the word strategic very lightly as Oluf will attest to this um uh, that um, not to intimidate but to say how do we how do we look at it to inform the bets that one might place from a product development point of view and and how could the, that also inform the teams that are executing against those bets that's where i'm coming from yeah uh at this time i've found that i at least in my daily work have been applying this in my efforts in support um, primarily assessing where there's a need for uh, a workflow or a um, where there where there's an iterative process versus something where there's something that needs to be more defined depending on how much knowledge the end user and how much knowledge uh, the the interim uh, whether that's l one l two or engineers need to have or have access to to be able to provide them with what kind of solution that they're looking for. A lot of the problems um, that I deal with can be simple, but then the overall uh, complicated nature would come about because of scale. And then complexity comes about when you have a number of individuals that are using the tool and platform that we provide in unique and different ways and being able to assess how the complexity becomes more uh, over time, particularly when we're in a process of deprecation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that I've seen this um, be very beneficially applied was to actually have people um, volunteered in the context that I was looking at it. They volunteered to join um, a crisis response team. And it wasn't necessarily to jump in and fix things, but it was more to exploit the fact that when you have a crisis, you also have a massive opportunity for innovation. So this was more a case of, oh my God, all six servers have gone down. These guys would be jumping in going, right, you, while you're fixing the servers, can we observe so we can see what else there is that we might be able to do that could actually not just restore the servers, but add something new at the other side of it. Um, and that came about from people having been taught Kinevin and going, oh, I see. All right. So you can actually set up. This is like the attractors so that when we're in that chaotic situation, we've got something that we can actually 
know that we're being pulled towards. Huh, and I wonder what we could do. Well, we could get some people ready for that situation. I wonder if that would work, right? And it worked very well. And again, it was one of those examples of going, I wonder what we could do. And you've got no, you've got no certainty, but at least now you're asking the question and maybe starting to set things up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I tell you, what, I always feel a little bit like I'm cheating when I just present this stuff. Because, of course, as with any of these things, so much richness that comes from going, let me show you a little something. And now I've shown it to you. Can you all just go and talk about that for 15 minutes and make sure that you've got something to come back and share with the group? There's just so much that comes out of it. And certainly the applied size of it, I, I actually would almost rather than just doing these as, as, as meetup talks, I mean, theoretically, all of this material goes together to train people in Kinevin and complex facilitation techniques, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and in that context, uh, the, at least the ones David um, Snowden, at least the ones I've been party to, uh, in his, one of his training have been yeah. really a, about problems that are hard to solve problems. Yeah. Like the pandemic, hard to solve problem. Yep. Right. So in a hunger, right. Yep. Or, uh, the, you know, versus necessarily um, technology. Yeah. And that's not to say technology, it's not hard to solve problem. It's just um, that, that technology tends to g give a narrowing paths to towards a solution versus in a humanly hard to solve problems like pandemic like hunger um five of us will have five different paths to try and and you know m and maybe five won't work or anything like that my, yeah. my point being that, that it requires much more of an attitude of a village in that sense yeah to solve those problems than the tech technology one because yeah. someone will always be whether you like it or not someone will be the expert yeah yeah you know that really kind of points to that thing of the move out of ac to the liminal area between chaos and complexity which is basically going hunger i don't know hey, why don't we ask lots of people who don't know and see whether we could find something coming out of that or the move back up into com complex where you go, I don't know, but um, I actually think we could design some experiments to see if any make a difference. But we need to run several parallel ones so that we don't bias ourselves, you know, the output of one experiment biasing the input to the next experiment. There's trouble with the, that part of it being because is that in the example of world hunger as much as the pandemic, yeah. the experiments... You, you can't afford to experiment because it means you know that in, imagine you had five experiments, let's say four were likely to fail, then at the, the, the four failing means those people who are relying on those four are going to die. Yeah. Bummer. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And same yeah. with the pandemic rules, right? That it, yeah. we Imagine we are the pharmaceutical and thinking this is the vaccine. So who's going to be the first one to try it? Well, yeah, who? yeah. I, I mean, I have to say the pandemic is really putting us right up against those kind of questions, isn't it? It's yeah. fabulous. Um, one of the the things that um, was really interesting to see that Dave kind of showed us as a bonus in this last thing um, was his flow chart for crisis response that he developed with the EU literally over the last two or three weeks. You know, I mean, I think as soon as the pandemic kicked in, he went into action because he's like that, right? No, it would have been more than two or three weeks, two or three months. And it's being published any second now. Um, and it kind of, if you've done a little bit around Canovan, you can look at it and go, oh, I can just imagine these extraordinary sessions that he would have led to have revealed that all of these are the spaces you need to go through one at a time to responsibly figure out how to handle this stuff. So um, I don't know whether it's going to be freely available. I would imagine it probably is, but um, I haven't had any news that it's been published. 
I'm going to be on a sort of Kinevin follow-up thing tomorrow morning, so I'll ask. But that would be fascinating to look at as a way of actually going, oh, wow, all right, knowing how this was generated, yeah, this is something that I could actually take an equivalent to the organization. Right. Yeah. And I've got to say, although they're, they're fairly pricey sitting in on the cognitive edge things, uh, there's a couple of things that just blow me away. The breadth of stuff that we cover, it's always way more than just Kinevin. The people that are in there, because it's always way more than just agilists and technologists. There's always a few of us in there, but it's fantastic being around government people, NGO people, um, not-for-profits, uh, people from academia, very different modes of thinking. It's such a refreshing thing to do. I mean, you know. Um, I'm going to have to drop off. Thank you very much, Andrew. And everybody. Sure. I really appreciate that. And I, I really appreciate you coming along, Terrain, because you've always yeah. been one of the coaches that I've admired and looked up to. And I love this feeling that we're dropping in and out of each other's stuff and oh. getting something from it. So I really appreciate it, mate. Thank you. All right. Yeah. See you guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head out as well. Andrew, You're going to bounce thanks. too? Yeah. Yeah, thank, this was great. Yeah, uh, good. Any, every, every time you have these, I, I love. Yeah, I don't know what the next one's going to be. There may be a couple of. Out. There may be a couple of Agile ones coming up because those are the people I know the most. And this can't yeah. be the Andrew show, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a good show. Well, well, it's a fun yeah, show. I, but, yeah. you know. Well, Andrew, we agreed that I'd be doing one in the next few weeks, right? Yes, exactly. Although so, mainly I'd be watching, mainly I'm going to be having us watch someone else talking and then taking away a 15 minute conversation. But there you go. That, that's leadership. Considering, <laughs> yeah, consi considering the discussion of protests and yeah. the action that we can take and the like, I, I would like to introduce the people here to a few different resources. Good. No, yeah, that um, sounds really cool. Yeah. If I'll, there's I'll video, see you all. That, yeah, take care, David. Stay in touch. If, you, if we're going to do that, Edward, I'd love to. And let's make sure we have a rehearsal because if you're running live video of Zoom, I know there's optimization yep. that you can set up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, so and we should, we we'll should. be sure to do that. So let's yeah. plan yeah. for a rehearsal on Sunday. Two weeks from now, if that Two, works. Yeah, that sounds good. The, there's a chance. I'm here. Uh, Dave, uh, Chris Sims, you know, the Agilist. Yes. He pinged me to say, oh, I've got a few topics. And I replied to him saying, those three sound interesting, but he's not got back to me. So okay. I if think he gets I'll... back to you, I want him to go first. But I mean, cool. just, I, I do want to be able to have this prepped for a time yeah. where we don't have someone. Get it ready and, as soon as you um, can. Get it yep. ready. And oh, we'll I mean, do it within two a two-week period. Yeah. 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 And also, uh, um, I have heard that uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Fred. Uh, he's an agilist, agile coach. Uh, what's his name? Fred. Fred Fowler. Yeah. Yeah. Fred oh, Fowler. Oh yes. Yes. Has I know. His South meet up Bay. on Sunday. Yeah. Um, that are now all on Zoom, and so I might start trying to attend those. That's a good idea. So, yeah, he yeah. does scrum case studies and stuff, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, he's, he's been... also expanded to doing a, uh, a scrum certification course primarily based in Latin America, which is interesting. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a low opinion to bring of it to other areas. certification, which is humbug because I've got so many bloody certificates myself. <laughs> I mean, but, I, I agree with that, but being able to bring it to an easily to a, to a market that may not have access to it right yeah. readily, because yeah. there's a, there is a language barrier. Yeah, like I we're uh, currently job hackers. There are some enterprising individuals, and I joined on with them that we're doing a uh, they're trying to build Scrum, but for people looking for work, like a oh, job okay. hunting Scrum product solution. Um, Interesting. And part of that is that we're coming together as a scrum to be able to build the actual product. But one of the things when I was talking about the definition of done that I was trying to put forward is mm -hmm. you need to have accessible language, you need to have visible formats, you need to be able to consider. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Understanding a definition of done in that case is very something that we're running into issues with right now. But. Well, don't forget, you need a definition of done for each different stream of work, and you may be working on more than one. Yeah, right? that's... 
And use Moscow. Use must, should, could. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Moscow is something that I have not heard of before. And Moscow, Mos yeah, Moscow. Mo yeah, Moscow is just, it, you, you could almost get away with using it for value estimation. You can almost get away, with, you know, it's a wonderful little mnemonic for a very let quick me, way of try finding that and sharing that with that group just to be able to see yeah, if it doesn't mark anything. The, I don't know if there's much more of a resource other than just knowing it. Right. Know? No, yeah. I hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I mean, that, that was the, uh, all the, that was the use of mural that I showed you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a whole bunch of job hackers trying to put, to get, put into user stories exactly the steps that you would take to be able to build visibility, um, job professionalism, other things like that, or not professionalism, yeah. uh, skills, abilities, and so forth. Yeah, 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 yeah got it. Olaf, have you, have you got anything up your sleeve that you'd, you'd like to have as something that we have a session about? Yes. Yes. Other than just not not finding no. anything there really. Um, no. No, I'm, not, I'm, not necessarily something to lead, but maybe something where it becomes like a big lean start, lean coffee or something. Yeah. Have a think. I I I I keep thinking about it every time that I come to one of these meetups. I'm like, I should try and come up with something. But um, <laughs> you know, I found out that uh that there are these um, you know, Michael Spade, right? Yeah. Um, he got into this thing called human design, I think, yeah. not too long ago. And um, there's a thing called a body graph. It's a little astrology mixed Ooh. with some other stuff. It's it's kind of weird. But um, he's actually in the Bay Area right now, and he's staying with someone that I know uh, from Agile Open. And she led me through um, a body graph exercise. Yeah. Turns out there are a couple of personality types in there called manifestors and generators. And the manifestors are the people who, who manifest stuff out of nothing. They like come up with mm -hmm. crazy ideas and they, they share them and do stuff. And then there are generators who take other people's ideas and they make them real. Well, I never. All right, this is sounding very like something that I came across a while back called Wealth Dynamics. Uh -huh. It's a lot to uh, Simon Wardley's uh, breakdown of uh, the, oh, what is it? He uses it, and there's a military analogy that he uses with commandos, uh, military, and police, but he also oh, uh, uh, yes. has it as the settlers, explorers, the yeah. innovators, and the, and settlers. Else. I can't remember, settlers. it sounds so older or something somewhere. It's in, yeah. yeah, settlers. Yeah. And that is all to say that it's based on your birth date and your date, uh, time, and location of birth, like um, a horror astrology. Story. Yeah, yeah. And it turns out I'm a generator in this system, which apparently means that I can't manifest anything. There you go. Which I think is maybe a little bit of a hogwash, but maybe also a little true. It, it's I, tricky, I think isn't that it? At the very least, it gives you a place to be able to start from. Yeah. Or if you wanted to be able to, if, if it's something where you recognize something about yourself you and you don't like what you recognize, that at least tells you where you can be able to start changing things. Right. Yeah, I think the trick with all of these is to be willing to doubt whether they're true, but to find the use in them. Always, 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 always. If science catches up at some point and goes, oh, fuck me, we've just found out how that stuff actually works. Turns out it is true. What do you know? Mm -hmm. That's great. I don't like scientism that goes, if science can't prove it, it's humbug. Right? Yeah. So anything like that, where you, you take the test and you look at it and go, ha, huh, interesting. You're right. If it, if it resonates with you and you go, oh, yeah, that makes complete sense. That and makes, it, yeah. And it kind of did and it kind of irritated me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's there's enneagrams. There's there's so many of them. There's um, that sounds to me like Edward's putting his his thing together in the background. Oh shoot! Sorry about that. That's all right, mate. Oh, um, I myself. There's there's this wonderful thing that I did a class in the GRI, the Growth Resource Indicator, which mm. is actually one of the better um, personality tests I've ever come across because the guy. Well, he wrote his masters on it. You know, it was one of those, um, and went ahead to teach it. And it's it is coherent. I love that test of coherence. Does it actually hang together? You know, right. 
Right. The, the wealth dynamics one was really interesting. It was a guy called Roger Hamilton, who's based in Singapore. Uh, very charismatic, great guy, has helped a lot of businesses. Um, and he's based in Singapore because if you do a big, you know, compass circle from Singapore, it covers half the damn planet and more than half of the population, you know. Mm -hmm. And he recognized that there's a cycle of skills that you go through to innovate. And it sounded very much like what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it was kind of the same thing. I'd have to go back and, and actually, you know what, I might have it right. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Here we go. Here's mine. And I am, what the hell is it? Yeah, it's, it, 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 it. oh God, I'd have to wave all the way through. This I did like, I don't know, 12 years ago. Mm. Yes, this has, uh, here we are. Um, I am middling for being a creator, a star, which I certainly recognize when I, I do speaking gigs. I'm like, oh, well, my, this is actually something which is natural for me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm not very good as a supporter, but it's right there. I'm lousy as a deal maker. Um, I'm lousy as a trader, I'm lousy as an accumulator, and I have no skill at all as a lord, but I'm quite a good mechanic. So I'm actually quite good at making stuff and talking about it, right? Mm. But you need all of these in their turns to get something from good idea to application. So it sounds very similar, and it would be, we might all have to wear, you know, um, aluminium foil hats when we do the presentation, right? But it could be rather fun to go, you know what, let's take a look at all of these different personality profile things. There's the old, uh, what was it called? Belbin was one that used to operate in the, the UK. There's uh, Myers-Briggs, which has now been thoroughly debunked as being complete horse shit. Um, which is a little unfortunate given that most HR departments still totally rely on it. Uh, oh well. Well, all that was just to say that I'm having trouble manifesting stuff. Well, that's a very convenient get out of jail, isn't it? It, it isn't feels it? like you should actually have a, no, wait a minute, I've got the card here. Yeah, <laughs> look, sorry, mate, can't manifest, <laughs> ain't going to happen. It's, there you go. Oh, all right. Well, you better go go home then. You know, that's just <laughs> that's just priceless. I love it. But um, no. But if you have ideas, give me the ideas. All right. I do keep thinking about it. Yeah. And and equally, uh, who who would you, who have you come across where you're like, well, that'd be interesting to hear from them. Mm. Um, I haven't yet pinged what's her name, the culture map woman, um, because she's in Paris, and I have that be a reason that I shouldn't ping her. Mm -hmm. But I, I would love to. I would love to ping her and say, look, I've got a, a, a small elite group. That's, that's you guys, right? <laughs> um, and if you're ever in, in our time zone and would be willing to jump onto Zoom, we would be so delighted to hear from you. You know, now that you mention that, um, something that I have not really done much on yet, but that you actually introduced me to at Agile Open was uh, Theory U and Otto Sharma. Oh, yeah. Would that be, I mean, I don't know if you can find him anywhere. Yeah, or finding can... Otto Sharma himself would be tough. <clears throat> I could find him. I know how to find him. And I'm immediately thinking of reasons why he'd say no, but it'd be kind of cool to get in touch with him. Ask yeah, him. That's you, one you idea. Give it yeah, yeah. And if he's not, well, I'm familiar enough with Theory U. I'm, we might have another Andrew show at some point. Because hmm. that's something that... I, you know, it, it's the trouble with doing this late at night is that I get tired. And so when, when Tarang starts asking questions, I'm like, oh, God, I don't fucking know. Stop asking me these awkward questions. Mm. But the fact is that like when I'm coaching, I'm thinking about Theory U, I'm thinking about Kenevin, I'm thinking about all, all of these things are right there at my damn fingertips. Oh, it's something else. What's clean, that? Clean language. Yeah, clean language. Yep. Um, there's a there's a woman down in San Luis Obispo who yes, I just uh, did a thing with. Her name is Sharon Small. I could probably invite her to come and talk. No, not that one. Yes, do. Um, if you have a connection, 
I've got a whole bunch of clean language stuff here. It's something which I have to admit, I, I want to pretend I know more than I do, but I, I, I can see the benefit of actually getting some training and practice in clean language and being mentored in it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm, I'm starting to do some one-on-one -on -one coaching at the moment, some personal coaching. And it's one of those things where I, I remember clean language and I'll go, oh, and what kind of blah, blah, blah is that kind of blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. huh. She just did a series of um, eight uh, one hour sessions over a couple of weeks. There you and, go. Uh, yeah. That's my cheat sheet for it. Yeah, ping her. So maybe I'll ping her and see if she's interested. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really good. Um, yeah, you see, she'd be another one that's a little bit like Elise. Elise goes, get meetings right, pff, everything else drops into place. Clean language is like, huh, find out actually what people are thinking, everything else drops into place. Right. Don't introduce your own stuff. Right. And it will lead them to new metaphors, which is how we understand the world. Yep. You know, I mean, you can map clean language into Kenevin. It, it's that move that comes out of disorder into complex, across to complicated, and potentially obvious. You don't want too much obvious. But as Which you actually... Is that, is that the blue one? That's the, that's the, the, the yellowy one. one. The yellowy. yellowy. One. Yeah, yeah. Right. Where you're just skating the everything shallow, around. shallow dive into, into chaos. Yes. yes. The, the grazes everything. Hmm. And the thing with all of those Kenevan dynamics... Those aren't the only moves. Don't take them as true. But, you know, as as Dave walks you through them, or you go, oh, no, that works, you're starting to get your brain into that mode of going, oh, I wonder if there's a pattern that we can find here. What can we do to see whether we can reveal patterns? What would follow from that? What's safe? How do we recover if it's not safe? Mm -hmm. You know, all of that stuff. I'm just looking over my shoulder at... You know what else would be really lovely to do a thing on that would be, um, oh gosh, uh, brain uh, liberating structures. Mm -hmm. Because liberating structures and Kenevin also go very nicely together when you start to realize that if you look at liberating structures through the lens of Kenevin, they make sense. Theory U, NVC, yeah, NVC maybe. Um, oh, I could bring you somebody on NVC, but you probably yeah? know as well. James Prieto. Oh, yeah. I know James. Yeah, you see, NVC, I'm in two minds about it. It can get to be... Oh, it can slide into that realm of just be nice to people. Yeah. I've also seen it as being abusive by to uh, lending towards those that are abusers, whether knowledgeable or not. Yeah. Uh, they can rely on that. If people know NVC and know the right kind of terminology, they can come out as the person with yeah. more status in the exchange. Yeah. You it, would have it, to make sure that it's applied to the business language and the business world, not, not the interpersonal stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, it is a, a, another tool for the malignant narcissist. Well, it's like NLP. Like NLP is another tool for the malignant narcissist. Absolutely. Uh, well, if you want me, I let me let me ping him and see. Yeah. Because I know he he wants to make that work his life's work, so he's looking for places to spread the word about his own Good. work, and and he's he's very generous with, you know, teaching yeah. and all that. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that would be nice. And he vaguely he would know who I am because we've met at Agile Open. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know each other intimately well. And I get it. I'm, it's funny. I'm, I'm looking at things at the moment where I'm like, I have a couple of tiny clients. I'm only getting two or three hours of work a week. But I'm so clear that I'm just not willing to do work where I'm justifying to myself that I'm actually sustaining the world I don't want to be part of anymore. Mm. I've got to do some work that creates the world I do want to be part of. So I've been thinking about that. Yeah. And, um, of course, I'm applying to regular jobs, like, you know, because I can't think that far out the box. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but then I then you look at stuff like were you were you in the um, Agile Virtual Summit that Adam Weisbart was putting on this week? I was not. No, I just had to. But honestly, I actually put was spending most of my time putting this deck together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the um, the reason why I bring that up is because there were two speakers there from Agile for All. Mm -hmm. You know them probably, Peter Green and Trisha Broderick. Yeah, I, well, I don't know them personally, but I know them. Yeah. You know of them. Yeah, yeah. And I've always wondered because Peter Green in his talk about Agile and managers, and that was a very good talk, um, he mentioned that he is part of this little team called Agile for All, but they're all independent. And yet they kind of have created this thing together. And so I was like, huh. Yeah. Well, first, how, how could I maybe become part of it? But then second, well, why couldn't we create something like that here? Yeah. I've had similar thoughts and a bit, actually I'll tell you what, what, where I bump up against that. It's that thing again. There's that bit of me that goes, the wealth dynamics thing. Uh, there's that bit of me that goes, yeah, that's a great idea. Oh God, I just wouldn't want to do all of that hard work. Too much work. Yeah. But you're right. That if you find somebody that goes, well, you don't have to do all of that hard work. That's what I do. Right. You know, I, I nearly joined OutFormation's, Dave Chilcott's outfit. Mm -hmm. And I think the only reason I didn't was that he's like, look, we, we don't have a marketing machine. You've got to find your own work. Right. And I'm like, yeah, suck at that. <laughs> you and me both. Right. Now, I mean, mm. I've, I'm, I, I know I'm smart enough and talented enough that always at some point somebody goes, oh, you should talk to Andrew. And I end up with the work that I want. My concern is that in this level of consulting, for some time I rested on my PayPal laurels, but they're too far back now. Mm. And I haven't done the marketing work of writing a book, of consistently writing a blog every week, mm -hmm. of doing all of that stuff where you actually now actually have to you set up all of the preconditions for people to go, oh, that guy, oh yeah, we should use him. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually coming from a bit of a way back and I look at that and go, I don't want to do all of that. Dear God. So I don't know, I may still slide much more towards personal coaching because I have to say that's one of the most rewarding things I've done for a long time mm -hmm. to actually spend time with somebody every week like a therapist but it's not a therapist it's a coach and have them every week go yeah i got something out of that yep i got some surprises out of that yep i'm using this stuff yep that resolved that thing for me yep and i have uh, a, a colleague who has done that for some time and he his approach is i charge them what they're being paid hmm. So he's got a couple of CEOs and he makes good money off them. And he's got a couple of people in not-for-profits who are paying him 10 bucks an hour, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't know, but it would be, I'd have to do the marketing to attract a, a few people who are willing to pay that, you know? Because right. actually I'm realizing he stopped, I think he might've stopped doing that, that pay what they're paid. I don't know. I've got to ask him how, what his fee structure is right now. Because typically, it's not just one hour that you put in with people. There's at least a couple of hours of work that go into preparation and follow up for each hour. Right. So if it was to be pay what, pay what you're, they're paid, you'd want it to be, well, I'm going to charge you double what you're being paid. Right. If your hourly rate's 100 bucks, I'm charging you 200. Right. You know, if you make a million dollars a year, then I'll be charging you quick sum, I don't know, 10,000 bucks an hour, whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be nice, right? Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. But yeah. Um, it's that pre-work. It's the pre-work. That, that's what gets you. I would it's be the, concerned if most of the millionaires that you'd be charging would be fitting against your values, though. I think I would probably have, I, you know, that would be, I could see me offering them things and them going, yes, and I can use that to exploit the great unwashed even better. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> oh well you need to do a values interview first yeah well that's just it the way how i know that you approach a personal co coaching engagement there's typically four to six sessions of dating first <laughs> yeah and you both if you have to get to a point of going yeah, yeah, yeah. oh fuck no jesus it needs to be a yes yes hell no right because if there isn't a hell no why the hell are you bothering to do it right right 
I have a lovely wife hovering in the background, and that oh. looks to me like it's time to go and get some supper with her. Oh. So I think I'm going to hover as well. All right. Do you say hello to your lovely wife for us? I certainly shall. Chloe's back here as well. Now. Good. Give, give her a big smush from me. Yeah. And tell yeah. her that I, I appreciate that there are wrinkles to saying I'm sad to hear about her mum. Yep. Yeah. You know. Okay. Hi, right, lovelies. So I'm out of here. Day. Olaf, if that leads to anything, great. And Edward, ping me so that we can set something up in, you know, in good time. Sound good? Yep. All right, guys.